Hey everybody, my name is Steve Watson and I'm the Maricopa County School Superintendent. Thank you for joining us live this morning for STEM Pro Live. And we've got some really exciting things queued up for you today. We're going to be taking a look at the Amazon Fulfillment Center. And we'd like to thank Amazon for partnering with us with this STEM Pro Live. And we're looking forward to asking some of their STEM professionals exciting questions about what goes on in the facility. Let's check it out. Welcome to this morning's STEM Pro Live. My name is Marlis and I'm the host of STEM Pro Live. And I am here in the middle of one of Amazon's fulfillment centers with one of their employees, Clint. Clint is gonna walk you around Amazon today, uh, talk to you about how they fulfill all the orders that come in and also talk to you about how he first got interested in STEM and how that led to a job here. So thank you so much for being with us again. Uh, and like always, feel free to send in any questions you have for Clint to answer later uh, in the chat room next to your viewing window. A little bit about my journey uh, during my what interested me in science, technology, engineering, and math uh, was early on. I enjoyed working with my dad in a shop. He owned a truck repair shop in northern Arizona. Uh, so I turned wrenches all the time, uh, working on jeeps, cars, boats, motorcycles, any of that fun stuff. So during school, I was interested on how it worked. And uh, as I got through school, I uh, started enjoying math. It always had a solution and I continued to work and learn how to get better at math, enjoyed science, uh, one of the best at English, but had to do it because it's an important part of our lives. So as I went through school, uh, I was a pretty strong performer and went into college, uh, went after a mechanical engineering degree. So one of the things that excited me about mechanical engineering was the rotation of things and how they moved and the fact that I could design something and know exactly it was going to work or it wasn't going to work. So as I worked through that, um, I got a little distracted in school, as uh, some people do, and it's OK. So I went, I went to work uh, driving a semi-truck. Lots of you know, the semi-trucks delivering packages all over the road. I started doing that, and uh, there was a, a point in my life when I had a, a moment that I realized that, you know what, I really wanted to get to continue to pursue that engineering degree and go after engineering. And uh, I was working on a construction site in Sedona, building the roundabouts. And I, they, I can re vividly remember the engineers pulling up. They brought all, all their blueprints and laid them out on top of the truck. And I went, that's what I want to do. I want to go design roads. So how did I go from wanting to design roads to working in Amazon fulfillment? Well, funny you should ask is I, uh, <laughs> I worked in a, in a local manufacturing plant in northern Arizona, went back to school at NAU, graduated with a civil engineering degree, uh, and when I got to my highways engineering course, I, uh, I hated it. It, I was, it was totally not what I expected, uh, and that was okay. I was working, uh, working full-time, going to school full-time. It took me 10 years to get to my degree, and during that time, I learned a lot about industrial maintenance, industrial engineering, project engineering. And I got the opportunity to do a lot of different things, work with controls, got to work with maintenance, large motors, small motors, uh, fire life safety systems, all of that. I completed my civil engineering degree and I went after a master's degree in civil engineering as well. I, what I found when I found out that I didn't like highways engineering, I was actually really good at designing and working with water of all things, right? Designing pumps and learning about that. And uh, it, it led me into a, a role within the engineering and maintenance world and within the industry there's you can touch you get to work on every bit of that as an engineer so if you're interested in how things turn and go fast how things are loud and cool uh, how you make things how things uh, go from a, a simple material to you know a package at your doorstep it's absolutely amazing getting the experience to do that so as you as you get an opportunity to learn you uh, find out what you enjoy doing and so 
What I enjoy doing is I enjoy the continuous improvement part. So we can take a, we can take a design or concept and similar to what is here in Amazon, this is an area where we take a customer order, a package, a widget, whatever you want to call it, and we put it on the doorstep of a customer in a very short period of time. And you, as you can see in this building, there's lots and lots of conveyors and conveyor belts and sort, sorters. It helps you do just exactly what it sounds like, sort through materials. And uh, so you will take those, uh, we'll take those pieces of equipment, you integrate it into a process, and now it goes from what was one item going out the door to thousands of items going out the door, and that makes it fun. And what makes it even funner is when somebody comes and asks you, so we got a thousand packages out the door, can we get a thousand and one packages out the door? So the fun part of the job is learning how, how to figure out how to do that. So my role, I get to do that. One, I need to make sure it's going to run every time we ask it to run, then figure out how to make it go faster and better. And that's what makes engineering, maintenance, and the continuous improvement process fun. And we do that every day in our jobs. And the important part of those jobs and the skills you're going to learn in school and pay attention to is all the science, technology, engineering, and math. So I told you a little bit about my journey. And here we are standing in the Amazon warehouse or fulfillment center, as we call it. I'm sure you want to go see it and go learn a little bit more about the process. This is a robotic work cell. We utilize robotic work cells to help us uh, pick, pack, and ship our products to our customers. And a robotic work cell that we utilize here helps us unload pallets off of totes, and it helps go up into the stow process. So what you're going to see here is you're going to have an associate put a pallet of totes onto the conveyor, and a palletizer for the robotic work cell in the arm is going to unload those totes right on the conveyor. My role with a robotic arm is you can see there's a lot of moving parts to it. So what we'll do is we come out here and make sure that it's ready to run. So what that means is every one of those moving parts is going to have some kind of maintenance aspect to it and or engineering aspect to it. There's pieces of control that we utilize in order to help identify where the tote is in space and we use that in order to help find the tote and then put, move it over onto the conveyor. All right, so now we're standing in the PickMod area. We just unloaded some totes at the robotic work cell. We've gone through some of the conveyance in order to get it here into the PickMod. Any of the items that you would find in our building or on the website would be able to fit in a tote. And you can see here, there's a lot of items here, right? So this is an area where we do random stow. So random stow or storage is where we take items by size and we put them on the shelves. And we use our barcode system and a barcode based on individual items and we stow them in locations where we have space. And as you can see, right, so we got a, we got a dictionary here, we got some fiber, looks like a hair straightener. I, I don't know, I don't use hair straighteners. My, my wife would use something like that, she would probably know. Uh, so this is the stowing process. The process is we put them in locations all throughout the building, and then we transition into our, our pick process. The pick process is where at, you as a customer orders that item, whether that be anything from A to Z. As you can see, the Amazon Smile goes from A to Z. And what we'll do is we, uh, we take that order in, and our pickers will walk through the building, scan those items based on the barcode location and the, the barcode on the, on the item. They'll scan that, put it into a tote, and we go back onto the conveyor system where we go on to the next process, which is our pack process. All right. So we just loaded our tote from the item that you just purchased on Amazon.com onto the conveyor. And here's an example of a conveyor where our engineering skills help us get to the next level. And literally next level, I mean the tote is going from the first floor up to our third floor. And in that first floor to third floor transition, we don't have a lot of space right here. So in order to achieve the same elevation change, this conveyor wraps up in a circle and in order to make that happen, we have to use engineering layout, engineering skills, math, science, in order to figure out how to make that occur in the same spot. So there's a speed that is set in order to make sure we don't slow anything down to make sure your customer order gets to you as fast as possible. And we'll move up to the pack mezzanine. Okay, so we just transitioned to where we saw the tote going up the spiral conveyor to the third floor. Now we're up here on the pack mezzanine where we're sorting out the, the totes. Those totes have a message on them to help us identify the location of where it needs to go. If you as a customer order one item, we're going to ship that one item to you. If we order multiple items, we're going to try to combine those items up here on the pack mezzanine. And we do that through this messaging system and the software that we've developed. 
So each one of these totes has a unique identifier similar to a text message that you'd use on your cell phone and it goes into the software program and then it comes down to that physical device here on the field. So out here on the, on the pack mezzanine where our team is responsible for taking that message and transitioning it into a actual movement of that toe on the sortation and on conveyance. So then we'll move that down over here to the pack mezzanine area where our packers are packing up your items for shipment. So we've just transitioned up here onto the mez to a typical pack station. So while this may seem like just a simple table, there's actually a lot of thought behind this into the way the layout is and to the items that are on the pack station. So you can see we have multiple different boxes on here. We have a tape machine as well. So we'll take that customer order and we identify the most efficient box or packing material in order to get our customer shipment to you. So for example, we have an A1 here. This A1, the computer system will tell our packers what size box for your customer order. We'll take that. Our tape machine has also got a lot of technology in it as well. Software development team has helped us identify the right length of tape for this A1 box. So we'll simply hit an A1, and it is the perfect length piece of tape for our box. We'll take your customer order, put it in the box. We'll finish packing that up. and we're ready to ship. So as we've built these pack stations and as customer orders change, this requires a lot of different iterations or tries at getting it right. So we take our t feedback from our operations team and the maintenance team will come up here and we'll rework and readjust these layouts in order to optimize this, the layout for our packers to make it as efficient as possible. Now we're here in the shipping area. Behind me you can see a, convey a very special conveyor. This is called our ship sorter. The shipping sorter is responsible for getting all the packages to the right location and onto the right truck. So you'll see a red light down there at the very end. It is scanning the box code uh, where your customer information is at. And then as it moves along down the conveyor, it is gonna divert with a shoe. We call it a divert, meaning, and you'll see the, the, the process where the shoe will move over and push the box off of the conveyor and down to the truck. So our team is responsible for coming in here and taking this apart, cleaning it up, and making sure that all the moving pieces and parts within them in the machine are ready to go when our operation team hits the start button. We've just transitioned from where we were, where we're up on that special conveyor where we're pushing the boxes down to the trucks. Now we're down on the area where we load the trucks. So you can see behind me there's lots of doors and lots of different trucks going to all different places across the United States and the world where we're shipping our customer packages. So this is where we work in teams in order to load the trucks and then we'll transition over and I'll show you where, what it looks like in the back of a truck. We have an example of what that looks like. So while we're working as in teams in order to load the truck, we're working to maximize the amount of boxes that we can put into a, a trailer. It improves the efficiency and the amount of packages we can get out the door. So this is what a typical loading of the back of a truck would look like that we ship out every day. So thank you for coming with me on this journey through one of our fulfillment centers here at Amazon. How you can see when you click and order an item on Amazon.com all the way to the package being delivered at your home. Good morning again, and thank you so much for joining us for today's STEM Pro Live. We're now ready to transition into our question and answer uh, session here with Clint. We've got some great questions coming in already. Um, so we're going to start with a few that have come in about the robotic arm, because I know that's a really cool thing that was probably the first time some students got to see something like that. So uh, first off, how does the robotic arm know where each tub is? Does it remember from time to time, or, or how does that work? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So uh, there's, a, there's some cameras on there, and when we, uh, when we set them up, uh, part of the skills that you develop and learn when you're working on setting up a robot uh, is the 3D space. So there's a physical location where that tote comes in and it should be in a consistent spot. But what it'll do is it'll find that space or that location in the 3D space, you know, in your X, Y, and Z planes and it'll identify that and it'll home to that position and that's where it'll start and then it has a sequence of programs built into the PLC that will step itself through as a computer program and it solves, a, solves working its way out. And now it can get stuck sometimes and when it gets stuck there's another subroutine that will be used to work itself out. 
So yeah, it takes a lot of teaching and it takes a, uh, the skills uh, you know, in engineering and math in order to uh, figure out where those locations are at and to be able to build that program. So. Very good. Uh, and related to that, what kind of background does it take to run or oversee a robot like the robotic arm? That's a great question. So there's a lot of different backgrounds that are uh, included uh, with running at least robotics in particular. So that's a, it's a, a type of skill where um, you got to have some good math skills. Uh, you also need to have some programming skills, basic programming uh, with the sense that you learn how a mechanical device is operated with uh, electrical inputs, um, and thus be things that are running through wires. So electricians are good at it, mechanics are good at it. Uh, you, you develop those basic skills, but there's also certification programs that allow you to get uh, after, after high school and uh, while you're working through high school that you get the opportunity to learn those basic skills. Um, and then it's practicing on the job. It definitely doesn't, uh, don't come out of school, take a test, and hope it's going to work. you got to go do it in the field. So Very cool. Um, and Serena from Mrs. Bird's class uh, has a question. How many different types of products do you stock there? Oh, man. <laughs> Millions. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have an exact count because it's uh, constantly changing and it's dynamic, but it's, it's in the millions, yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Um, and a couple questions came in about how do you, how do you restock all the products? How, how do the products get to Amazon? That's a good question. So there is a... We have a lot of software that is behind the scenes that helps keep uh, a balance of those products and based on what customer demand is, we work on ordering and putting in into the shelving units throughout the building and that helps keep that balance of uh, products that customers are ordering and uh, keeping the inflow from our vendors coming as well. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, and now jumping to a few questions um, specifically about you and your work uh, and past. Was there a particular person that inspired you to go back to school for engineering? Yes. So uh, at one point I had a, uh, my uh, parents' neighbor actually was, a, was an engineering manager and uh, he, had, uh, he, had the, he knew a lot of answers when you asked him questions mm -hmm. um, and he had an engineering degree. Uh, so he not only knew how to work with his hands, but, and that's the background my dad had, so I was excited about that, but I also learned how, uh, you know, he was able to talk me through theoretically how it worked, mm -hmm. how it worked on paper before anything was ever built. So, uh, yeah, that was an inspiration. He was a great inspiration to me uh, growing up, so, yeah. Very good. Um, and then related to your work today, what do you love most about what you're doing today? Oh, uh, it's challenging. Right, so every day it's hard work, um, and it was that's how engineering is just in general. Uh, there's no easy problem to solve, uh, even as fundamentally as you think it may be. So, you go out there, you're presented with lots of challenging problems, and uh, you get to go work on solving them. Sometimes you don't solve them, and probably some of those those are some of the best experiences you get are the ones you don't solve because you learn how to not do it again. Mm -hmm. um, so, you go out there solve the win and sometimes you solve and fail and uh, the most important thing is learning how to move forward when you go when that happens. Fantastic um, and that yeah someone else also asked what are some of the difficult parts of your jobs and do you ever really have to uh, persevere through um, challenges and so it sounds like absolutely, absolutely. That, that's, that's every day that's every day right so uh, um, and that's that's where the balance of utilizing teams in order to get through uh, those difficult difficult times there's a lot of times you got to leverage the strengths of other folks uh, that you're working with, uh, your partners on teams, people that you n maybe normally wouldn't talk to, uh, you'd be surprised that way you can solve as a team versus trying to go out there and do it by yourself. Perfect. Fantastic. Um, and going back to uh, what you talked about um, as far as the continuous improvement process at Amazon, uh, can you talk more about that? Are there particular steps you take um, in doing that? And then uh, that might roll into a question from Michaela, who's watching this morning, who wanted to know more about Amazon's goals. Oh. So I feel like those might, yeah. Yep. So, so that, that's absolutely uh, great questions. And that's exactly what uh, our jobs are in general when it comes to Amazon is always trying to find a better way of doing things faster so we, we always start with the customer and work our way backwards um, but fundamentally uh, when, it, when you break it all the way down the basic engineering um, problem-solving techniques are used with every continuous improvement project regardless if it is uh, um, related to mechanical equipment or not and uh, we utilize those skills, right? So you, you collect data, 
you identify what the problem is, uh, you evaluate that data, you find the people that help, that have the skills in order to work against it, and you go, uh, you gotta understand what that goal is, the outcome goal, uh, and how you go out there and make it happen, so. Awesome, and a question from Caden in Mrs. Bird's class. What happens if a product is broken there at the Fulfillment Center? It's a good question. So we actually have a process uh, dedicated to handling that within the building. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a lot of products in the building that uh, can get dropped and things do happen. So we have a process that handles the damages uh, within the building and it's a good safe process. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, and then we did get a question, and some of you who are watching uh, might be a part of STEM uh, clubs or classrooms that maybe received uh, some donated, donated items uh, from Amazon that uh, we helped distribute a few weeks ago. Uh, and so the question came in, are you the person we should thank for the donated items that came to our STEM club? If so, thank you so much. Absolutely. You guys are very welcome. Very cool. Um, let's see. Lots of great questions coming in. We'll try to get... Um, as many as we can in the time that we've allotted for this morning. Um, question came in from Kim Hansen. How many boxes does your location send out on a normal day? Uh, it varies. It varies day to day. Uh, I don't have a, a firm number on that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and I think you might have mentioned this uh, earlier as well, but how big is the Amazon Fulfillment Center? So the, uh, most fulfillment centers vary in size, uh, but you can go ahead and do this as a little math problem. You can fit 28 football fields within the first floor of our building. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And related to that, do you have any idea how many boxes can fit in each truck that goes uh, out? I have a feeling that varies quite a bit to you. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question from, the, you know, from an engineering math size, right? So there's uh, the truck sizes for the most part are all the same. Mm -hmm. But the products that are ordered in the box sizes that go in there vary every single day. Every customer orders something a little different. So uh, there's a way to optimize that and get it close. We, you know, we s showed that uh, at the very end of the video there, um, but it's not perfect. Yeah. 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 So. Very good. Um, yeah, and I hope we're able to get to um, as many, just great questions coming in again. Um, what does your average day look like from my, start to finish? My average day is uh, a lot of variables that come into it, right? So I. I I have a, a calendar and a plan that I look at, but my, my day goes into starting off how did, uh, how did the building run from day to day and what items did we, uh, did we have some opportunities on and what items can we go out there and improve to make sure that we're meeting our customer requests and uh, making sure we're ending with the customer in mind. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, and another question about the Fulfillment Center in general, how many people work there? Uh, it varies as well, right? Yeah, so that one, that one varies all the time um, and is based on customer demand. So that one I don't have a firm number on. That's fine, but I know, yeah, around the holidays it always yeah, yeah, increases. Absolutely. And yep, perfect. Um, and what kind of math do you use during the day or day to day? Oh, man, <laughs> use, use math every single day. So uh, for the most part, your basic, uh, you know, your four functions, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, however, the fundamentals of calculus come into play uh, that we use in um, understanding how to solve problems when you're uh, taking uh, orders from all over the place and you're wanting to get it into one piece of machinery that runs at a fixed speed, but you don't want to have that slow down. Uh, so you have, to, you have to have the fundamentals of all different types of math skills in order to be able to you know, do the job from day to day. Yeah. Very cool. Um, Another great question uh, that came in, what is the average time from start to finish at the factory for a, a package for delivery? Um, another good question. It depends on a vari uh, another set of variables, right? So if, you're, uh, if there's a selection of how fast you want to order it um, and the, in the shipping request, uh, that can change. It also changes where it is actually physically at in the building as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so if it is coming in and off a truck, it can go through there very quickly, and there's other times that it will come from uh, tougher parts of the building to get to, and it can take a little bit longer. Awesome. Um, uh, and Christy Tenney has a question about, is there a reason that packing the boxes is not automated? So there's a lot of robots doing different things, but that's still done by hand. Yes. So uh, part of that is there's lots of, once again, lots of variables to the items that customers order. Um, and in order to make that process happen quickly, uh, people are actually faster at doing it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, let's see. 
Um, another uh, question that came in, what kind of job designs the process for picking a packing? Was that an engineering position as well? And is that overseen by someone? It, it, it is. Uh, so once again, there's several different types of categories of engineering. Uh, that would be along the lines of software development engineering that uh, developed that. But there's a lot of, all those skills come into play when you're, when you're working on that type of software. So Fantastic. yeah. And a very timely question just came in from Kim Hansen who asked, does your location use drones to deliver packages? No, we do not. <laughs> Awesome. I know, yeah, there's a lot in the news about that starting to happen, but not at this particular location. Um, let's see. Okay, so we talked a little bit about um, the delivery of items to um, the Amazon Fulfillment Center. Mm -hmm. We've got a few people wanting to know more about where those products come from um, or if you actually make any of the products. That's a, that's a great question. And actually, uh, we, they come from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So. Wherever you can find on the on the website, they come from all over the world. Absolutely. Very cool. Uh, do you ever clean the conveyor belts? A absolutely, every day. Oh, fantastic! Every day. How long does that take, and what does that what does that look like? It, once again, depends on the size of the conveyor uh, and how dirty it can get. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, absolutely, we work on it every day. Awesome. Um, and what do you do with packages that are returned? Uh, so we actually have a full return process, and uh, we handle them, and uh, we'll do a, we'll call, do a couple of different things. But uh, the goal is to make sure that we uh, that they're in good shape, and if they're able to be resold, then we work on reselling them. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, and then final question. I know there are several questions we haven't had a chance to get to. Um, we might be able to have um, uh, Clint answer some of those uh, after the fact and post them on our website along with the final um, broadcast today. Um, but yeah, final question uh, for you. If there are students who are sitting there watching and saying, that seems like a really cool job, I might want to do something like that in a few years, what advice do you have for them about what they can do now to prepare for a position like that? Absolutely. So uh, one of the keys is it's, it's hard to get to, to, to learn engineering. It's not easy. Uh, so I would say you know, perseverance is absolutely critical. Don't give up. Follow your dreams. Uh, and learn how to work in teams. We don't go out there and do anything alone. Uh, we work in teams. So it is critical to learn how to communicate with your teams. Don't give up. Have fun with it. It is fun learning, and uh, even when you even when you fail, you're going to learn something from that experience. So continue to work hard and enjoy yourself while you're doing it. Yep. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Clint, for being here. Thank you so much, students and teachers, uh, for joining us today. I um, want to make sure you all know that um, if you signed up for today's STEM Pro Live, which you all did, you're going to be receiving a, an email either later today or tomorrow morning uh, with today's broadcast online. So you can watch it again with different classes or go over it again. Um, and uh, we'll also be sending out information about our upcoming Solve It monthly challenge, uh, where um, you will be able to join um, other students in your classroom and taking on your own distribution challenge at your own school. So we hope you'll be willing to take that on, take some of what you learned today, and see if you can uh, perfect a distribution model in your own classroom. So thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, Clint, for being here. Uh, and watch for updates on our next STEM Pro Live.